What's up, everybody? Man, it really feels like Monday. I don't even have this light on. I just We're just winging it today, but we're here, and it's lunchtime at trial, so it's time to go. It's time to talk about what happened at the end of the day on Friday. It was kind of a short afternoon, and then we're going to talk about this morning, specifically focus on Seth Kenny, who is one of the main alternative theories for the defense that Seth Kenny is to blame. Seth Kenny is at fault, and he is the one that should eat the brunt of this. He is the one that let the um, live ammo come on to the scene and the set of Rust, and therefore, it's his fault, not Hannah Gutierrez. She was set up to fail by Seth Kenny specifically, and uh, we get to hear from him today, and there are some times where he sounded a little shady, sometimes where he said exactly what he needed to. So I'm going to be interested on what you guys think and what you feel as far as um, how reliable his testimony was. I think that's really important for the jury to assess is what was his involvement? What did he know? Was he negligent? And we've got to assess that before they can really move forward on how they feel about Hannah Gutierrez. Obviously she was negligent, but did her negligence actually cause the death? Because if she didn't bring live ammo on the set, she wasn't the last one with the gun and she didn't hand the gun to Alec Baldwin. I think the defense has a pretty good argument, but can they get there? is the question. Can they get there? Hit that like button if you guys haven't already and make sure you subscribe to our page so you can be here for all of our future videos. If you just hit that reminder bell. All right. So we're going to start here with the medic who had a tragically sad story to tell. And it was really difficult to listen to her testimony. Somebody on set for people's safety realizing there shouldn't be this type of dangerous activity on set. And then when the worst happens, she's thrown into the mess to try to fix it without the proper tools that she needs, because these are not the types of injuries she's supposed to be dealing with. She's supposed to be dealing with a bruise, a cut, maybe a broken finger if somebody falls, but not gunshot wounds. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we remember that as we listen to it and she saw Hannah acting unsafe on set, not doing proper safety checks, confirming basically what every other witness said. Um, and she went through the treatment that she tried to render for Elena Hutchins. Um, on cross, a common theme, she has also sued everyone. She has a judgment against Sarah Zachary. The defense is able to point the finger at other people. Um, and the, the defense is going to use her pointing the finger civilly at other people, including Sarah Zachary in part of their argument that other people were at fault. Now she also never told anyone about Hannah's safety concerns. And I think that's a good point for the defense that everybody, um, is pointing the finger at Hannah now, but nobody brought it up when it was actually happening. Uh, sorry. Somebody asked, Melissa said, sheesh, the chat's moving. Um, how would one's own testimony in a trial help them in their own separate lawsuit? Well, the only way testifying in a criminal case really helps your civil lawsuit is if somebody gets convicted, they're per se liable civilly. So if Hannah Gutierrez is guilty of criminal negligence, then it's a lot easier to prove civil negligence. I would say in this situation, it's already pretty easy to prove civil negligence, but it can help if the defendant is convicted in a lot of different areas. It's a battery case and they're convicted of battery. We talked about this a little bit with the uh, uh, Johnny Depp case. If there was criminal convictions, then we would have had, you know, another jury that would have pointed the finger as who was actually at fault. We didn't in that case. Um, and we don't in this case yet. So then because the defense keeps bringing up these lawsuits, making them relevant to the case, the state has the ability to ask questions on them. And that's what we're going to listen to here. And oh boy, was this bad for the defense? And then we'll listen to how the judge tries to strike it and it just keeps getting worse and worse. Uh, here we go. Okay. Um, you were asked some questions about a civil lawsuit and you, you were asked if you were testifying today because you thought it would help your civil lawsuit. Right. Um, and I think your response was, you didn't do it for money. That's not how it started. So I'd like you to, and then I think you got cut off. I'd like you to go ahead and finish that. And because it was relevant, because the defense brought it up to show her bias, it's appropriate for the state to ask this question so she can combat her bias and explain, no, I'm not really biased. Reason that I brought any kind of lawsuit to anybody in the, in the, in the beginnings is because I wanted change in our industry. I did not want something like this to be able to happen again to anybody else, to their families, to the crew that knows them as family. 
um, I wanted some sort of change to happen, some policy change, um, whether it be required to have a standby ambulance or it be required to have additional medics if there's going to be big stunts or big gunfire or anything that could potentially cause you know, somebody to become injured. I wanted that change in our industry because on that, on that show, there were 75, roughly 75 crew. That is minimal to compare to what I normally would have on set. I would have no less than 300 usually before I would be approved to have an additional medic to come and help me. That is just not okay. That is not okay. So that to me, some bonus points for the state, but also from the defense that it was generally unsafe and should be safer. And that's why she did it to make it all safer. Now, that doesn't absolve Hannah Gutierrez because she was involved in that and part of the unsafe conditions, but that's not where it ends. Okay. And being the only medic there with two patients, knowing my resources were not close enough to, to help in any significant way is what I wanted to change. And... Have you suffered from uh, extreme trauma uh, as a result of this? Yes. Because when you basically say, oh, you just filed a lawsuit for money. Ugh, it must not be real. You're just trying to snake somebody for money. You have the opportunity to say, no, it's not true. I actually did suffer emotional distress. But then when she goes into it is when it gets inappropriate. But once it's out of the tube, you can't get it back in. Um, I, can I just expand? Sure. And so yeah. in fairness to the state, in this one point, she was going to move on. The witness wanted to continue to talk about it. Defense didn't immediately object. That's how it comes out. That's why you've got to object. And sometimes the jury thinks you're mean for objecting. So be it. You have to do it. It's your job as an attorney to prevent stuff like this from coming in. Uh, I, okay. And again, not because it's not true, but because it's not relevant and appropriate to this case. Oh, he did object. I guess he did object. They're at sidebar now. So he did object. And the judge incorrectly allows her to expand on it and then goes back and tries to take it back. So I forgot that he objected here last Friday. Um, so he did object. He did do his job. Congrats to him. I apologize for saying you didn't. He did object. He did the right thing. The judges who screwed it up to allow her to even testify to this because she should not have. And she tries to walk it back and can't. Upon my questioning, you asked if uh, I asked you uh, about your claim for uh, emotional distress and, and you responded and asked if you could expand on that. The court is going to let you. Please expand. Thank you. I went home that night and I looked at my little boy, who's the same age as Helena's son. And all I could think about is how I could not save his mother's life and how he was going to grow up without a mother. And how her spouse. It's brutally sad, but it's it's past the realm of relevance. And it definitely, definitely is a lot more prejudicial than it is probative, probative of any fact for this case. You don't Lost have to prove pain and suffering in this case. You just have to prove that there was death, which they've proven. And how her spouse lost the love of his life. Uh, I did not expect this testimony. What did you expect? I did not expect this testimony. Um, so you're going to, I, I mean, no harm to you. But we're going She to means that she's like, all due respect, I'm going to strike it, which is appropriate and what she should do. Um, but I don't know what she expected when she wanted to expand on her emotional distress and pain and suffering. Strike that testimony. Okay. So disregard that testimony. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. All right. So I just want to play that clip because the jury did hear it. And while you tell them to strike it, it's probably going to affect them. Um, they understand how serious this is. And that's the point. When you talk about a lower level felony like this, sometimes it can feel not as serious as a higher level felony. Those are the types of things in testify testimony that really make them feel exactly how important this is. Um, AKA the cat lady said, you can throw out all the witnesses and the videos are still damning to Hannah she didn't do her job. Bottom line, she is guilty. Let me know if you agree with that. I definitely think they need the testimony as well, but the videos and a lot of the recordings and things like that are not good for her as well. So the state is doing a pretty good combination of both, I think. Um, people are asking, is her lawsuit uh, relevant? 
I don't think the state would be able to bring it up if they just wanted to, but once the defense brings it up, it's definitely fair game for the state to ask about it on redirect. Ain't that the truth, Cheryl? Okay, the next witness was a script supervisor turned substitute teacher after like 40 plus years doing it, 70 plus movies. She's the one that always makes sure that, you know, if my top button is unbuttoned, I don't button it in between scenes and then it's buttoned on take two. So then in the middle of the scene, I have one button and then two buttons. I thought that was kind of cool that that's what she does. Um, and we, again, just like we've heard so many other witnesses, we get to hear her uh, compare Hannah's Hannah to other armors. Now, to me, one of the issues with this is she has some inconsistencies with some of the other witnesses. And when you have people that are not experts and you have people that are wranglers and prop people and script supervisors and grips and cameramen and whatever, all describing what an armorer does, if they don't actually know, if they don't actually know, it can create inconsistencies about what her duty actually is as the armorer, which I think is interesting. And maybe defense can use it. Maybe they can't, but let's listen to her explanation of what an armorer does comparing it to what she's seen on her 70 plus other movie sets. Maybe. No, unfortunately not. Um, how did Ms. Gutierrez compare to the other previous 24 armors that you worked with? I found her to be inexperienced and did not present in the, in the way that I'm used to seeing professional armors, union armors uh, on a film set. It was different. Um, did you find her behavior on the film set to be professional? I did not. Um, did you, did you ever take notice of where firearms, uh, were stored during filming or around the set? I saw them on her cart. And when you saw them on her cart, was she present? Not all the time. And... Was that unusual? Everything about the cart was unusual. When you say everything about the cart was unusual, can you explain to the jury what you mean? In my experience, what I have experienced on film sets is that the armors are very quiet, uh, focused, and very organized. Everything is very organized. And they're very focused. I don't know if I said that. They're very focused and sort of methodical about okay. everything. Their movements are very methodical. I'm going to take you back to your concerns about the cart specifically. Um, can you explain uh, what your concerns were with the state of the prop cart? Well, I just never seen anything like it. it. It just reminded me, I mean, it's not that it reminded me, but the best way I can describe it is it was like that drawer in your kitchen where you just put stuff that doesn't really go anywhere else, the random things and you're going to look for something. And I think it's a good, a good just, it was visual for most of us. To me. I've got one of those. Different than what I was used to. Did it seem organized? No, it did not seem organized. Um, at, at any point in time, were you aware that there were what I'm going to refer to as accidental discharges that took place on set? I was on the set at the cabin. But hang on. You're, you're, you're a step ahead of me. Um, were you aware of the accidental discharges? So she, she heard one of them, but she goes on at some point to explain that like every time they do fire a dummy round, you're supposed to open your mouth and plug your ears. First person that's ever done that or said that, which again, I think is interesting when you have all these different people explaining things that might not be experts or armors. Um, the prosecutor was even rude to her own witness at one point with this witness, uh, she called 911, said accidental shooting, uh, and the prosecutor asked why you said accidental shit. She didn't want the law enforcement or EMTs to think there was an active shooter and delay sending medical help. Um, she is suing everyone too for money, but she doesn't think this testimony is helping her. She's just there to tell her truth. And he talks about how it's impossible, on cross, he talks about how it's impossible for Hannah to be in two places at once as the prop person and the armorer. Uh, Joe said, not shading the lawyers, but watching the trial makes me miss the prosecutor on Brooks uh, with the direct and Camille 
with cross-examination. Yeah, I mean, every lawyer has a different style. Some lawyers are definitely better than others. Some are better at the actual trial experience and questioning witnesses than others. Um, so I get it if you like watching one more than the other. A couple of people kind of have this sentiment. Um, Shani said, the issue I'm having is Hannah getting the bulk of the punishment when all of these other people didn't do their job either. It's all a mess. And Julie said, I think she's guilty, but I think a lot of people also are responsible. So a lot of people have paid civilly and been sued civilly company-wise, including Seth Kenny, who we're going to hear from, and including Sarah Zachary. And more than just she has been charged criminally. David Hall has pled to a misdemeanor, could have been charged with this potentially if he wouldn't have taken a plea deal. Maybe Hannah Gutierrez was offered that plea deal. We don't know. Um, so he's been charged and convicted and, and served his very weak sentence at this point. Baldwin has also been charged criminally with a felony. So she's not the only one charged. There's one other person charged with a felony and one other person already convicted or pled to a misdemeanor. So other people are being held responsible at all as well, civilly and criminally. I think that's important. Um, I think that's important to point out. Uh, Kenny and Sarah didn't like Hannah and wanted to get her fired. They set her up to have a failure and did not think it would end so badly. He has been directing this investigation from the start. So Ranger fan, I want to hold most of this until we get to Seth Kenny. I'll leave this comment up here and we'll get back to it later. Um, all right. Then the beginning of today, we hear from a still photographer who took lots of pictures. She was specifically told to take pictures of the gun pointed at the camera. She assumed the armor was checking. Baldwin was clearly the boss. Uh, she confirms low budget films or, or everybody is cheap um, and that people were kind of rushing. She admitted most of that on cross on redirect. Did you ever see Hannah checking the guns? No, but she wasn't really paying at attention. And anytime the prosecutor didn't get this witness to say what she wanted, she would just lead her, put the words in her mouth. She would say correct. And there were no objections. Uh, then we had Popple back. The officer we knew was going to have to come back because the state wouldn't let them get certain pictures in, but the state called them to talk about other things. Um, there were more clarifications using pictures that the live PDQ ammo did not match the live ammo on set. I think they did a good job there of kind of proving that it was not from PDQ once again. I, I feel like they have proven it. The live ammo is not PDQ from PDQ. Let me know what you guys think in the chat. John, why don't you throw a uh, throw a poll up there? If you had to guess or, or vote, I should say, so put who brought live ammo on set. Put PDQ, Hannah, or Billy Ray. Those are the three options we've really heard from. It had to come from one of them. Um, and I don't necessarily know if they've proven where it came from. Circumstantially, they've got some evidence it was from Hannah, but I do think they've kind of proven it did not come from Billy Ray or PDQ. So is that enough to get the vote for Hannah? Um, or you can put not proven, John, as the fourth option. So who brought live ammo on set? PDQ, Hannah, Billy Ray, or not proven? And then let me know what the results of that poll are, because that's really interesting to me, and that seems to be a huge question in everybody's mind. Um, on redirect, she said she was there specifically to locate similar ammo. Um, and none of it matched what was on set. She was really only looking for 45 caliber live rounds from PDQ when she executed the search warrant. Um, cause the, on the, on cross, they asked her, did you find this? Did you find that? Things like that. All right. Next witness. And we're going to bring up the video from today and start breaking that down. And uh, this witness was Craft Services. She stayed at the hotel with Hannah, and this is how they're going to prove the tampering charge, the cocaine, the drugs that Hannah was on that they've already referenced to try and um, prove another element of negligence. Obviously, nobody would want their armor, I don't think, using drugs um, while on set and performing these duties, and that alone could be negligence. Um, so... John, let me know when that poll is live. GM said she's the safety person. She deserves most fault. I don't know if I'd say most. Um, I do think potentially there's an argument Alec Baldwin deserves most, but she definitely has a duty here and she breached that duty. Katie said Seth asked Sarah to throw away ammo to cover both their butts, maybe, but the ammo in those rounds wasn't fired. So if they did prove there was more live ammo, would they have been able to prove that it was from Seth? I think they definitely would have been able to prove Sarah loaded the gun and didn't load it appropriately, potentially. Um, but let's hear the explanation of Hannah Gutierrez handing what is allegedly cocaine to this witness. And I think the defense has some argument here um, that maybe they can't prove that this was, in fact, cocaine. Were you present at the hotel 
uh, the evening of October 21st, 2021. Yes, ma'am. And at some point that evening, did you go to Ms. Gutierrez's hotel room? Yes. And why did you do that? Um, Court and I forget what his name was, but the set steward um, were in her hotel room and needed to go to the store to get something, did not want to leave her alone. So they called me and asked me to come up to her room. Okay. And did you do that? Yes, ma'am. Um, and did you stay with Ms. Gutierrez for a little while? Yes, ma'am. Um, and then at some point, did you leave? Yes. Um, did anything unusual happen when you left Ms. Gutierrez's room? Yes. She asked me if I could hold on to something for her. I said, yes. She put it in my hand and I walked out as there was a knock on the door. And after you uh, left the room, did you look to see what she had placed in your hand? Yes. And can you describe, without making any assumptions about what it was, can you just describe what you saw in your hand? Yes. It was a... Without making assumptions of what it was, then they ask her to assume what it was in a minute. Clear Ziploc baggie with a green small Ziploc baggie inside, and there was powder inside the green bag. What color was the powder? White. Um, if I want you to compare this to like a sugar packet that it you would... was definitely not sugar no 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 no. i'm sorry let, 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 let <laughs> me get my like sugar let me get my question out okay um i want you i want to i want to have a discussion about how much was in the green okay part and i want you to compare it to a sugar packet that you would open and put in coffee or tea okay how many of those do you think it was maybe four or five okay which seems like a lot i guess i don't know but basically i think it's to prove it wasn't just a little bit but a lot of what what they are saying is cocaine and stephanie yeah, they don't have a presumptive positive test or any kind of test of the cocaine to say it was. It's just based off the description of what this person describing. I thought that was interesting as well. I didn't know that this is how they were going to prove the cocaine. And I'm not so sure I would convict on this. Just this is basically it. What I'm playing you is basically all of the proof they have that Hannah Gutierrez had cocaine at some point. Different from saying she's smoking weed in the text. I do think they can prove that she was doing drugs in and around the time that she was the armor. But this is, I would say, no, this is not enough for me to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and Ms. Smith, how old are you? I'm 50, 51. And when you were a younger person, uh, did you have an opportunity to use the drug cocaine? Yes, ma'am, I'm a recovering addict. Um, are you? So she is a recovering addict, which I think gives her some credence in describing what cocaine is and how she would know it was cocaine. Familiar with what cocaine looks like? Yes, ma'am. Are you familiar with the way that cocaine is packaged? Yes, ma'am. Um, based on that experience, what did you believe to be in the bag? I believed it to be cocaine. And what did you do with it? I threw it in the hallway trash can before even going downstairs to my hotel room. And why did you throw it in the hallway trash can? Because like I said, I am a recovering addict. I can't first and foremost have it in my possession. And second, I was, I was really very offended and it didn't want anything to do with the situation anymore. Okay. Um, That's it. That's the proof, basically. And we're going to skip ahead to hear some of the cross-examination. Um, and he tries to say, oh, it could have been this. It could have been that. Some weak arguments, but I'll let you listen to them. It's, they're true, but I wouldn't have necessarily gone the way he went. I would have just said, you didn't test it for cocaine. You didn't taste it. You didn't smell it. You're just saying it looked like cocaine, but you have no way to actually prove it was cocaine. That's just your opinion. You're not an expert. You're not a law enforcement officer. You're not a chemist. You're not a pharmacist. That's kind of the route I would have gone. He does a little bit of that, but then he also says like, it could have been creatine, which I was like, Ooh, creatine. Actually, creatine does have that kind of crystally substance, but different than sugar and, and protein powder is a definitely, I, I, I definitely know about creatine and protein powder, and that is not the same. Uh, protein powder and creatine, I'll just say, is not the same consistency. We're called over and it were, um, you could see she was visibly distraught, couldn't you? Yes. And didn't you say that you they're were continuing with that? They're going to connect those dots later that she was distraught. If there was any inconsistencies with that first statement, it's but because she was so distraught. Stay with her that night, make sure she was okay. I said I would stay with her for a little bit, yes, until court and the steward came back. Okay. And at the time you left, had they gotten back? No. So before they got back, despite your word earlier, you left. Yes. Okay. Um, didn't uh, did Ms. Gutierrez Reed also go to your room that night? No. It's like he knew she was going to say no. Now, your testimony is that the last time you used cocaine was approximately 20 years old. Is that right? Yes, sir. So that would have been, I think, 31 years ago? Yes. And since then, thankfully, you've been clean. Is that right? Yes, sir. So you have not seen that substance in 31 years. That's fair to say? No, that's not fair to say. I just think that was a horrible line of questions. It's like, you haven't done coke for 31 years, so you must not know what it looks like anymore. 
way. Not again, not the route I would have gone. I just would have gone with the fact that she's not an expert, not law enforcement, pharmacist, chemist, whatever. She didn't smell it, taste it, touch it. She just looked at it through two bags or whatever. I mean, that I, I didn't love that. And there's some people I think that could be offended by that to think that an addict forgot what cocaine looks like. Okay. I have seen it, just not used it. Okay. Now you, you stated on direct examination that you believed it to be cocaine. Yes. And you recall stating at one point that you said it could be cocaine or meth? Um, I don't recall saying that, no. Can you recall at your pretrial interview being asked the question, what was in those baggies? Inside the green, well, inside the snack baggie was the green baggie. Inside the green baggie was a white powdery substance, which I knew to be cocaine, or I mean, it could have been meth or something too. To me, this is improper impeachment. Maybe New Mexico has a little bit of different rules because these are pretrial interviews, not depositions. You're not supposed to read the answers aloud. You're supposed to give her an opportunity to read them, ask her to fix her answer once she doesn't, but whatever. It's right in front of the jury. So the jury heard that in her pretrial interview, she said it could be cocaine or meth. Now, both illegal, both bad, both you're not supposed to possess this way, but it does prove the defense's point that it could have been something else other than cocaine. Because She didn't taste it. She didn't test it. She didn't touch it. She didn't smell it. None of that stuff. And she, even she thought it could be multiple things. So I think that was good. But then again, do you remember what cocaine looks like 30 years ago? And then he also asks like, it could be sugar and other stuff or whatever too, which I think some people could roll their eyes out a little bit as jurors. It could have, okay. but I don't believe that it was, nor did I state that I believed it was. I just said it could be. And that was my question. I'm just asking if you said it could have been meth too. Correct. So in reality, it could have been a number of other white powders. Would you agree with that? Sure. Uh, do you know what creatine looks like? No. A protein powder? Mm, yes, because I work in craft services. Okay. Um, and we could go through a whole list of items, but there's a lot of white powder, powder sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Powdered sugar. Yes. Okay. Not the so same. the reality is you have a belief, but you don't know for certain what was in that bag, do you? Correct. Now that was never tested? No. And that was never provided to law enforcement? No. How long did you hold that baggie before you threw it in the trash? I didn't make it all the way down the hallway. So how many feet do you think that was that you walked? Uh, I don't even know how many feet the hallway is long. So, can you, I mean, can you look at the courtroom and estimate just telling us? Um, possibly to the distance of the gentleman in the blue suit. Okay, is he sitting at the council here, table? Yes. So, would you agree with me that's about 20, 25 feet? Sure. Okay. So, you walked 20, 25 feet, and were you looking at that bag the whole time or were you having it down by your side? At first, it was down by my side, and then I, of course, raised my hand to look. Okay, now, weren't you walking past some police officers too? Um, men in uniform. I'm not sure whether they were police officers. Well, what are the units? She thought they were police officers. He impeaches her again. Um, and then the last question, he basically says, you're not certain what was in that bag. And Hannah asked for things, plural, not one thing. I don't know why that was a big deal, but you're not certain what was in that bag. And she says, no. To me, I, I think you got to go not guilty here. Um, I do want to listen to that last question here so you guys can hear it and you have you really other than your guess you have no idea for certain what was in that bag correct so i mean are we going to convict people based on other than your guess you're not certain what was in that bag and she says correct to me there's just no way you can convict on those charges um and karen asked how do you think the defense is performing some good some bad like i said i think he hit some really good points here some other things are maybe too many questions, but this is me playing Monday morning quarterback, picking it apart, saying what maybe a perfect cross would have been like, but executing it. I think he got the point across that he needed to. So I think he did a good job. There've been some times I think he's, you know, missed some objections, not pushed back as hard on the prosecutor with her kind of personality, um, which I understand how sometimes that happens. But overall, I think he's doing fine. I don't think he's blowing the case. I think the worst thing he did was have that pretrial interview with law enforcement before the trial way back when. Um, Ranger fan said, he thinks there, or she thinks there's too many questions unanswered to get a guilty conviction. Um, GM said, did the defense give explanation of what things she wanted back so strongly? No, just trying to poke some doubt into this witness's testimony. And then we're going to get yes, to yes. redirect. Have you, seen regular Have you ever seen powdered sugar packaged like that? Never. Have you ever seen regular sugar packaged like that? Never. Have you seen cocaine packaged like that? Yes. And that's a great point. When you say powdered sugar, when you say sugar, who packages it in little baggies like that? What about cocaine? Is that how it's packaged? Yes. So if you would have just left some of those examples off, 
I think potentially it would have been better. And he could have just argued that in closing. It could have been sugar. It could have been creatine. It could have been protein powder. It could have been a million different things. She even said she wasn't certain. But to give the state the opportunity to come and do that on redirect, I think was effective. Um, you were asked some questions about your um, contact with Ms. Gutierrez inside the room. Uh, did you, when you were in there, in Ms. Gutierrez's room visiting with her, did you speak with her? Yes. Um, did she uh, mention to you that she was extremely worried about Ms. Hutchins and, and Ms. Hutchins' death? No, ma'am. Um, what specifically did she say to you when, when you were in her room with regard to... I don't know why this is relevant. I, I would object to relevance. Like, she wasn't super upset about Helena Hutchins' death. What does that have to do with her negligence in causing death? You didn't say she did it intentionally. You're not here to prove that she hated Hannah Gutierrez or, I'm sorry, Helena Hutchins or had some motive or anything like that. So why are you asking these questions? Why is that relevant? I would have objected to all of this because I do think it's damning that she's sitting in the room immediately after distraught, giving somebody cocaine to hide or get rid of or hold on to for later. She's not caring about Helena Hutchins or Joel Souza. She only cares about her career. That's just purely to make her look bad in my opinion, but they let it come out on redirect. To any concerns that she had. Yeah. Um, what specifically was the room visiting with her? Did you speak with her? Yes. Um, did she uh, mention to you that she was extremely worried about Ms. Hutchins and, and Ms. Hutchins' death? No, ma'am. Um, what specifically did she say to you when, when you were in her room with regard to any concerns that she had? She was concerned about her career. She was concerned about being prosecuted um, because somebody got shot. All right. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. And then we take a little break and we get to Seth Kinney. This is Seth Kinney. So you can take a look at him as we discuss his testimony. Um, he still has his business, which I thought was interesting. Talk about how he met Thel, Thel Reed, I think is his name, Hannah's dad on Django Unchained. He's the, the, you know, big time gun coach. They work together on the Yellowstone projects. Um, but that it's really hard to get this 45 long Colt dummy ammo or live ammo. And Thel would get most of it. Um, and he said that blanks, he described it as blanks never look like live ammo, but dummies look like live ammo. They should never be stored in the same spot and all dummy ammo should shake and make that rattle noise. Sometimes people are changing it and make it rattle less because you used to be able to hear it in some movies with a trained ear that if they were manipulating the firearm that had blanks in it, that you could hear that rattle. And obviously you don't want that. Um, he said he gets his dummies and blanks basically hundred percent from Joe Swanson and that he was asked straight up, did you provide any live ammo on the set of rust? And he said, no. Um, he did say that Baldwin's gun was brand new and he did provide, you know, 30 ish guns the day of the shooting. Sarah Zachary did call and text him. Um, he and Hannah had a disagreement on 10 16 about the accidental discharge where she yelled ex expletives at him. Um, and then eventually he started to figure out he was being blamed when he saw a morning show with the lawyer, Hannah's lawyer and Thel Reed on uh, the morning show together, basically talking about it. And then eventually he got sued by Hannah Gutierrez and he realized they were going to point the finger at him. Um, and he was basically cooperative with law enforcement the entire time. And, uh, the state tries to get into the content of the lawsuit. There's an objection. The judge sustains it, doesn't allow them to get into the content of the lawsuit. And instead just asks him the final question of, was that lawsuit ultimately dismissed? And he says, yes, but any smart jurors, I think would think, well, did he pay her? Did insurance pay her? Did she technically win? And that's why the lawsuit was dismissed or was it without merit? And it kind of leaves some open questions about his culpability, even civilly in this case. But if anybody's paying attention, I think they can realize that everybody paid out civilly on this case because everybody basically screwed up, including Seth Kenny, even though he did not necessarily admit that he screwed up. Um, on Cross, there's a little comparison about the training done on, on Rust versus on the 1883 or whatever that show is called. Um, he weirdly cannot explain when he brought ammo back from 1883. I thought that was very weird. Like conveniently he was forgetting stuff and he went back and tried and still couldn't figure it out after saying live ammo and dummies should never be stored together. He's like, but we all saw the live ammo, um, labeled in the PDQ headquarters and there were dummies all around. So why'd you do that? And again, he can't really explain that. And it makes him look a little hypocritical on cross. Um, when he explains his inventory, how he writes it on a piece of paper and he keeps it all up in his head and it's very casual. It's not a word people usually like to hear around firearms, around live ammo, around dummy rounds, especially when we're talking about this set that was incredibly sloppy and he trained Sarah Zachary and, and Hannah Gutierrez who were also very sloppy and we hear him say 
basically do as I say, not as I do, because he says these things should never be stored together, but he himself stores them together. And there were just guns kind of laying all around um, at his property. I also thought the defense did a pretty good job of impeaching him on some different things. And he basically said, oh, well, I don't really remember that interview, that pretrial interview. And it's like, really, that's your explanation. Okay. Um, I think this is where I want to be here. Yeah, he starts looking through his statement. So let, let, let's play a little bit. Let's listen to some of his cross so you guys can hear. Because one of the really important things um, that Ranger fan brought up that I want to hear from you guys is that do you believe him as a witness? Do you think he's a credible witness? If you're balancing all these witnesses against each other, David Hall, Sarah Zachary, Hannah Gutierrez's testimony we've heard from the videos, Seth Kenny, who do you believe? Who do you not believe? Because that's going to be a big part of it. Tom basically said he thinks Seth seems kind of sketchy. And we're going to listen to some of his cross examination so you guys can kind of make that determination yourself. He's showing him his statement to see if it refreshes his recollection. Thank you, Azam, for gifting a membership. So they're talking about color of primers and, and other things. Detail. Detective Hancock, that you had given a number of prime cases to Sarah? Well, it's interesting because it, it says prime cases. Thank you, Heather, as well, for the gifted membership. And that, I would have said primed. Um, I, I never say prime cases. I just sounds like you're ordering some off of Amazon. Uh, so I don't recall that conversation. I'm not, I'm not, I don't even know what I'm referring to in that, uh, in that conversation. He doesn't recall that conversation and he doesn't even know what he's referring to in that conversation. I believe this interview was done in July of 2023. So like barely more than six months ago. And his answer to any inconsistencies is just, I don't really remember that conversation. I hate when witnesses do that as a lawyer, it Im immediately makes me think they're lying or trying to change their testimony. But I don't necessarily know if jurors feel that way, which is why you guys are so important to tell me how you think Vicky, this would have also been a great question to that witness on redirect by the state. Do you usually try to get rid of your sugar before the cops come or get rid of your creatine to make sure they don't see that you have creatine on you? Well, do you recall that there was discussion about um, those being there and that you looked for a picture to show Hancock? No, I don't remember. Okay. Do you recall stating that chances are they'll all have the same color primer? I this conversation, I just don't remember the particulars of this conversation with, with Detective Hancock. But okay, so this might have not been the pretrial interview. This could have been an interview Hancock did two years ago. I'm not positive. I, th I thought he was reading his pretrial interview. Do you recall at all, regardless of the conversation, that Sarah Zachary had primed cases on the set of rest? If they're on the invoice and it's and it's a, a, a dummy, or excuse me, it's a blank round, and I would include a primed case in a, in a blank round invoice, um, cause again, it's, it's consumable. Um, I would not be surprised if, if they got prime case, uh, blanks, let's call them. Well, sir, that, don't you know that, don't you know, you provided that to, to Sarah Zachary? No, it was two over what, two and a half years ago, but this was a, I mean, and he just doesn't remember what he provided to Sarah Zachary or not. Again, I try to, I'll try to reserve my ruling by the way, um, on the vote of who brought, John put the ammo on set. I wish he would have put live ammo was the, was the point. So hopefully you guys all got the point of the question, which was live ammo on set, not the ammo. Cause there's tons of different kinds of ammunition. Hannah Gutierrez got 42%. PDQ got 10%. That's higher than I would have expected. Billy Ray only 1%. And I think that's just cause he was barely mentioned, but 46% of you think it's not proven, which is interesting. I wonder what you guys think about the case. We're going to hold off on voting on guilty, not guilty yet, but that's a very interesting poll to me. Traumatic event for everybody. You talked to you, you. You remember that, don't you? I remember it being traumatic. Yes, no, you absolutely. Remember, you remember providing those cases because you discussed it for five pages in this. No, I don't remember. And again, the lawyer's testifying that he discusses that that conversation or what he gave to her for five pages, which again is makes him seem even more suspect to the jury. But that's inappropriate for the lawyer technically to say, "Well, you were talking about it for five pages," but I can tell why he's annoyed. Creatine is like something you take as a supplement that's supposed to help you build muscle. Basically it, it like holds water around your muscle, makes your muscles a bitter, bigger, helps your muscles recover more. Um, it's basically a, a workout supplement, protein, powder, creatine, that type of deal. Do you recall during this conversation as well, that you called a man named Troy Teske? I've called Troy Teske a number of times in the last six years. 
I'm, I'm asking you specifically during the interview with Detective Hancock, November 1st, do you recall that you, in, you called Troy Teske? In the interview room, yes, with, with Detective at the, yeah, the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office, yes. Yes, because he was at lunch, you called him, you were trying to reach him. I, yes, now I, I understand what you're talking about. Okay. And do you recall also calling Joe Swanson as you were sitting down with, with the detective? I do. And do you recall when you asked Joe Swanson whether he had put these in boxes, uh, how many rounds he had made in total, he said about 700 uh, is what you said. You recall saying that he had made about 700 rounds? I have a vague recollection of, of the conversation with, okay. with Detective Hancock, yeah. And as you're talking to Joe Swanson and you ask him if they were in the box or the green ammo can, do you recall he's on the phone with you and you're asking if they were in the green ammo can and you say, Shh. God, well, I mean, still trying, damn. You recall saying that? Vaguely, yes. You also recall saying, uh, you said it twice, you said, Shit, shit, shit. Well, she still didn't do her effing job. You recall saying that? That sounds like me. Again, the defense brings that up, and we're going to hear him wiggle around a little bit more here and be a little evasive as a witness, but it sounds like he's like, oh, no. Could it be me? Could it be Sarah Zachary? Now, he ends up kind of being evasive about it, but I think that was a good thing to bring up impeachment-wise by the defense to say, even he knows he did something wrong, but he still said, well, she didn't do her effing job. So he still points the finger at Hannah, so again, even if Seth, Seth Kenny has some fault here, I think the defense is really struggling to completely pull any fault off of Anna, Hannah Gutierrez or absolve her from any liability criminally here, even by pointing the finger at other people, including Seth Kenny, who was just a piece of the puzzle or a por portion of the equation that Hannah Gutierrez was a huge part of. So when you find out, and I don't want to get into what Mr. Swanson told you, but when you find out whatever you find out on the phone, you say shit, shit, shit twice. Hmm. Why did you say that? I think I was worried that it was going to be some of these rounds that that Thail had given to Troy Teske and had been using, um, you know, to shoot right, shooting live rounds. That somehow they migrated in in some of Thail's leather or um, you know through Hannah in some way, and that again we were going to be here saying Joe Swanson live live ammunition when he's primarily. 99.9% .9 of the time, he just provides movies and television shows with blanks and dummy rounds. And that he was really worried about Joe Swanson. That's why he said that. And he was also really worried about Hannah that somehow live ammo got mixed up and that's how it made its way onto the set of Rust. He was really worried about them. He definitely was not worried about himself. That's an uncomfortable situation for Joe Swanson. So you just gave a long explanation and you just uh, kind of Blamed, try to blame Hannah in that, didn't you just now? How did I do that? I well, you, you gave the implication that you were worried that this was going to be some that Bill had and Troy was shoot. And and again, that, that's to try to link it to Hannah, isn't it? No, no, just just telling you my thought process at that point, trying to figure out where did this, where did the rust live ammunition come from? And was it going to, you know, point back to Joe Swanson? Okay. And I just don't understand why the defense is acting like anybody pointing the finger at Hannah in her trial called as a witness for the state would be a surprise. But these witnesses continue to argue, oh, no, no, we're not trying to point the finger at Hannah. It's like, why not? You're here testifying against her. If you think she did something wrong, if you didn't think she did her effing job, then just say it. Do you recall on July 11, 2023, you interviewed with myself and Ms. Morrissey? Uh, you recall that, sir? Yeah, the, the Zoom meeting. Yes, I recall that. And do you recall when I asked you the same question, shit, 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 why did you say shit, shit, shit? You said, I don't know. And that was the extent of your answer. Do you recall that? Yes. So back in July. Also, you guys tell me, it's a good question for you as jurors impeaching a witness when they say, I don't know at their deposition or previous statement. And then at trial, they say, I don't know. I was just hoping it wasn't going to come back on this guy. Is that effective impeachment? They said, I don't know two times, but they give a reason at trial. I've seen attorneys do that. I've never seen it be incredibly effective, but maybe I'm missing something. You guys can tell me if he says, I don't know both times adding like a reason that might be true that he's not saying absolutely is true. This is my answer seems ineffective to me, but maybe it makes them look like they're lying, especially when um, there are other things that he's saying that make us think that maybe he's being a little evasive as a witness. 11, 2023, your memory, would you agree with me, would be fresher to that time frame when you said it than it would be now? Well, not if, if I had reviewed things or, or something else jogged my memory of that event or, you know, because it was a highly, it was an emotional time. And that, the, you know, I found that largely when things are emotionally charged, um, there, there kind of needs to be uh, some kind of gateway between the present and recollecting how I felt and, and the way things were at that point in time. And, and I understand, but you, would you agree with me? You gave a different answer on July 11th. I don't know than you do today. Well, I don't know if I don't know is really an answer other than at that moment in time after 
us discussing it. I hadn't thought about saying shit four times in an interview with a detective. The rounds, again, that went to 1883, came back at some point to your place. Again, some of those reloaded rounds from Joe Swanson were Starline Brass. So the, the 1883 Cowboy Camp, training camp, just to be specific. Yes, some of those Thale Reed, Joe Swanson reloads came back to PDQ in Albuquerque. And as well, uh, some of your dummy rounds also were Starline Brass, correct? Correct. And they had nickel primers? Correct. Right. And the live rounds found on set that were Starline Brass also had nickel primers, correct? On the set of Rust? Yes, sir. From the evidence photos, yes, those were nickel primers. As well? Yes. Okay. And in addition to providing replica firearms, did you put, provide rubber firearms to the set? To the set of Rust, yes. Okay. Did you provide uh, over 3,000 rounds of ammo? I don't know what the total of, if we're referring to uh, blanks. Blank, yeah, blanks, yeah. 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 I don't know what the total is of blanks to Rust. I've never totaled it out. Uh, well, other than the invoice, that would have been the only time. When you would get a request from Sarah Zachary uh, for additional rounds that were needed, would she come pick those up from you at your place? I think once uh, once the initial supply of blanks and uh, and firearms were provided to to Sarah, there was only one other occasion that I can recall Sarah coming and getting anything for Rust from me, which was on October twelfth. Okay, and do you recall Sarah and Hannah coming before Rust started to your place? I do. And at that time, didn't you give Hannah her leathers? as well as firearms and ammunition. I, yeah, I vaguely recall that, uh, yeah, that she got that done. Because in fact, Hannah had mailed you uh, the letters back from the old way at the end of that set. You recall that? Yeah, she had shipped. Yeah, the way that they answer this stuff as if it's no big deal, Mo, is like, how do you run a business that way? Especially a business with this type of product. It just seems crazy to me that like, this is okay. Like, this is great. We didn't get any industry standards on how you're supposed to run, you know, his type of business because he can't possibly be the industry standard. Uh, everything from Montana to uh, me in uh, me in Texas. And so when you received those in Texas and the leathers and everything else, you brought them back to PDQ Props? That's correct. They uh, were, the leathers were in the same box. They never got pulled out. Um, the replica firearms did get pulled out, but the rest of the leathers remained in the box. Okay, sir. Then you gave that to uh, Sarah and Hannah for their use on the rest set. Is that fair to say? Well, whatever she was going to do with it was up to Hannah um, and Thale. Okay. Um, but you, you know they got used on the rest set? I don't know that. I, I'm just, I can assume that's that's where that leather went to. Okay. Now I want to ask you uh, some questions about the dummy rounds that you answered earlier. Um, you did indicate that dummies that do not rattle can be dangerous. Is that right? Dummy rounds that do not rattle are not dummy rounds to me. Okay. And I think you've... And so all this stuff is important. And the defense is going to make a good point here that there were dummy rounds that didn't rattle there. Here's the problem. Hannah Gutierrez was the one that was supposed to rattle them. And she said she did rattle all them. So if they didn't rattle, why is she using them? She should know that they're not safe and you shouldn't be using them. That's the point to, to confirm this stuff or to make it seem like, you know, she was set up to fail. It's like, but if she would have done her job and called it out, that's the point of the armor. And I know this question. Marilyn, I wonder if you were trying to trick me. It's the armorer's responsibility, as we've heard, the athletic or the athletic director, the uh, assistant director, AD, also is responsible if you know he's handling it and looking at it and stuff too. But ultimately, it is up to the armor. Said because it, it is dangerous when an armor is trying to figure out maybe in a high speed environment, maybe things are going on. You're trying to distinguish between a high speed environment, things are going on. Doesn't mean you don't have to do your job. Imagine me being like, oh, I. Uh, filed the wrong piece of paper that made us lose the case because it was really busy at my office that day. Sorry, you can't, what do you expect me to do my job when it's high paced and fast and hard and stressful? It's like, that doesn't, that doesn't give you the ability to just bypass your duty. I run a dummy and it will not rattle. Uh, it doesn't rattle. Didn't you describe that as being a dangerous situation? Well, certainly because you don't, it's like a firearm that you can't check is, is unloaded. You have to assume that it's loaded or that the, the round is live and it's not a dummy round. Yes, sir. And you also state. And John, you're right. And they've testified that a million times. But what he's saying is he doesn't think you should use the ones that don't rattle because they're too dangerous. That's what he says. Nirvana has the fact that most of the camera crew quit the day before been introduced. Oh, yeah. A ton of times. Watched all the footage of negligence proven, but not manslaughter. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it, that's what the jury's going to have to decide. And yes, they've talked about how the uh, camera crew quit a bunch of times in the trial. It that you would not source those type of rounds like Denix rounds that do not rattle, right? That's correct. And it's one of the things you said that 
you would not be in favor of having a mixture of dummies, some that rattle, some that don't. That's a dangerous situation, isn't it? Well, it's a, you know, I work with, with prop crews a lot. They're not specialists, they're not armors, but they are charged with the responsibility of having gun belts and dummy rounds on set. And if they get the idea that dummy rounds don't necessarily have to rattle, bad precedent, deadly precedent. It sets a deadly precedent. And on this set on Rust, you're aware that there were those types of a mixture of different types of dummy rounds. Are you not well, I, I'm not, I wasn't aware of that. that because... Well, you weren't before. But you are now having reviewed the pictures. Yeah, the Denix round is a costume round that doesn't rattle. So after you reviewed the pictures from set, you're now aware that there was a dangerous mix of types of dummies, some that rattled, some that didn't. Well, the Denix round is not dangerous. It sets a, a dangerous precedent. Okay. You know? I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying you can fire it. I'm just saying, in your words, it can set a dangerous precedent. Yeah, it's, right? yes. It's not an ideal situation. Not, not at all. Okay, sir, I want to talk about your... So uh, Hoku said... We know Peter, but prop master needs to make sure before the scene is secured too, right? Even Alec Baldwin should make sure that gun is safe. So I will just tell you, I am not an expert on this, but I have watched this entire trial. I haven't really heard anybody say that Alec Baldwin, somebody that's an expert say that Alec Baldwin had the duty to check it. I think the, the, uh, the weapons expert actually said, no, he can check it if he wants to, to feel warm and fuzzy, but it's my job to check it as the armor. It was the guy that was that you know, weapons expert that seemed very smart to know everything. Some people said he should just for gun safety, blah, blah, blah. But I think everybody has said you should never point a weapon at somebody without wanting to hurt them, basically. And you should treat every firearm like it's loaded. And Alec Baldwin absolutely failed there. And I think they're going to have ways that Alec Baldwin failed. But is he the one that actually had to load the gun or even double check it? To me, I thought the answer was going to be a clear yes. I don't know that that's actually been proven. Prop master either. Um, it's been proven that the armor should. And... Even Hannah Gutierrez at this point admitted, Vicky, that she loaded the gun. But what she's saying is, well, there was time for somebody to mess with it. Maybe there was sabotage in my fanny pack or from the time I gave it to, to Halls before he gave it to Baldwin. Maybe somebody else messed with it. But originally, she is the one that loaded it, I think, even by her own admission. Your interactions with Detective Hancock in this case, when the case started, do you recall you had a um, meeting or call with her? Maybe the same day as the shooting incident? No, I don't. I don't. With Detective Hancock? Yes. On this, on October 21st? Mm -hmm. Don't recall it at all. I don't think it happened. Okay. You recall that on the course of time after that shooting incident, you called Detective Hancock over 40 times? Yeah, it sounds about right. You think it might have been higher than that? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, and during that time... So again, he's cool, calm, and collected. Yeah, definitely I called the lead investigator 40 times. It's very unusual. And I think it could be very effective, like Melinda said, in making him look ske sketchy, except for the fact that in this case, it has come out multiple times that this defense attorney, Hannah's dad, and other people connected to Hannah, Alec Baldwin, this guy, everybody involved basically was contacting law enforcement, trying to prove their innocence and try to not get them or their client arrested and charged in this case. So it's not actually that unusual in this case. And I wonder if the state will start bringing that out more. And they could have asked Hancock how many, because, you know, this guy obviously hadn't been charged. Hannah Gutierrez eventually gets charged, so they stop reaching out as much. But if they say early on, was everybody reaching out to you the same amount or was somebody reaching out to you more? Things like that. They didn't bring it up with Hancock, but to me, everybody was reaching out to law enforcement in this case. Azam said she finally caught up on two times speed and now it's slow-mo. I try not to do anything in slow-mo, but you're here. I'm, you're sharing information with her. She's sharing information with you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then she share you materials from the investigation. And there's Hancock. The, times? the first time that I think she showed me anything was when they were executing the search warrant on the prop truck. She was showing me, I think they were black and white grainy photos. Okay. That was the first time I saw anything. Now, do you recall providing uh, Detective Hancock some of the live rounds before the execution of the search warrant? I did. Okay. So you provided her some, and was that in a bag, or how did you give those to her? Well, interestingly enough, they came from that jammed lever action rifle, and they happened to be uh, the semi wad cutter live rounds. Uh, they were in a small Benelli shotgun choke bag, and I had written on there in, in black ink live, and there were between five and seven, I believe, that I gave her. Okay, and you, you volunteered those to her, and, and she took them, and then they came to search after that. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And again, there was a month time frame or so, roughly, between the shooting incident and that search of your place. Yeah, I believe it was over a month because it was after Thanksgiving. So, yeah, over a month. Did, did you have any inkling or thought that they were going to come search? No, not at all. Even though you had been in contact with the detective and other people before that, you knew they were investigating? I knew they were investigating. I had no reason to believe that they would be executing a search warrant on my business. Now, did you provide your DNA to Detective Hancock? No, I did offer it, though. You offered it? Yes. And they did not take you up on that? That's correct. 
Um, and they did not take your fingerprints either, did they? Well, my fingerprints are in the system already um, through the, if you're a federal firearms licensee, that's just part of the licensing is that your your fingerprints go into the, the digital federal system. And, and I understand that, sir, but my question was, did you did they take your fingerprints? Again, no. Okay. Well, they didn't take it the first time. That was somebody else. That's true. Okay. Um, now I want to ask you uh, a different topic. After this, you were asked on, on direct, if after this October 16th accidental discharge, you had had an argument with uh, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed. Do you recall that? It, by text message, yes. Okay. And you recall after that that you wanted to fire Ms. Gutierrez-Reed? So, I mean, look at his face. He's going to try to, you know, wiggle out of this one too. And Louise said, why can he not admit he want to fire her? I said the same thing when we talked about Sarah Zachary and stuff. It's like, what's the big deal? Why can't you just say, yes, you want to fire her? Quibbling about it almost makes you seem less honest than if you just come out and say, yes, I want to fire her. I, I thought the same thing, Luis, same thing. But we're going to listen to him be like, ah, I'm not so sure I want to fire her. Eventually he's like, if I wanted her fired, I could have got her fired. After he starts with, well, it wasn't my place to fire her. It wasn't that I wanted her fired uh, because it wouldn't be for me to fire her. Um, she can tell me to go to hell all day long and it, it wouldn't make a difference to the rust production. Um, it doesn't, you know, I've got five sisters and two daughters. I'm used to it. Um, so if rust production is happy and they were, you know, they, Sarah Zachary said, she's a great armor uh, that I've seen the, she, the defendant Hannah, she sent me the text message that the director had sent her after a big shootout on blank ammo shootout, big, big and, shootout. And Mr. Kenny, I, 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 that my question was pretty simple. Okay. Let me ask it again. Okay. Um, you, you just testified that you did not want to get rid of that. You did not want to fire Hannah. Is that your testimony? It's it's not that I wanted her fired. She was doing a horrible job at props. That was an issue. Um, okay, you answered my question, and I, I just want to know: it's a, it's a real. It, I, I had mixed feelings about it, and yeah. I think that's why you know. In fact, I reached out to two common friends with Hale, saying this is a situation. You know. Okay. Well, did do you recall in your interview on November first, stating she was just being an idiot? I wanted I wanted Sarah to get rid of her. Collectively, yes. I mean, you know, even now, frustrated with her, but at the same time, you know, understand, well, you know, what she's up against. So it, it's, a it's like, it's like he's saying stuff without really saying it. He's like, yeah, I did say Sarah should get rid of her, you know, and, and still now I'm frustrated, but I understand what she's up against. It's like, uh... Mo, but her defense was that she rattled all of them. Not I rattled some and some were costume rounds. She can't say that it was a non rattling dummy, but she was saying like, Oh, it was so half them didn't rattle. There were all these issues. I thought she did say some of them had holes in the side. I can't remember now, but I know she said some on set had holes in the sides. Those wouldn't rattle, but she could also see those were dummy rounds. Gingy prob said, I'm concerned about the onset vibe. That's quite a power differential for her to correct the powerful man for what it's worth. I work in HR power differential can be used. Uh, a mitigation regarding penalty decisions. I agree. I think it's very hard to, to imagine somebody this experienced and young standing up to Alec Baldwin or stopping this whole set when everybody was yelling about, we got to get it done. We got to hurry up. I definitely think there was liability and especially civilly on the powers that be and the bosses and Baldwin and everybody, the producers, and they're all getting sued and I'm sure paying out tons of money. But at the end of the day, she should have quit. That's the point. She should have not taken the job or quit before she created such an unsafe, environment that it could foreseeably lead to someone's death, which I believe it was foreseeable and did lead to somebody's death. Will the jury see it that way? I don't know. I don't know. I think there's a lot of people that are at fault in this situation. Steph asks, what do you think the lawyers could learn from this whole trial? In my opinion, day one was filled with unprofessionalism. I agree. Um, forcing and pushing the judge to do sidebars, not speaking objections, um, being tighter, not allowing the prosecutor to lead witnesses, um, I think he's kind of this defense attorney. I heard he's a, a real estate lawyer. I don't know, but I do think he's getting a little bit better with that. The judge forcing them to come up, I think is better with professionalism. You can't change somebody's personality or how good they are at, you know, presentation necessarily. Um, but I do think that there's a lot to be learned from this trial. Um, we got 4,000 people in the chat. Make sure you guys hit that like button if you have not already and make sure you subscribe to our page. Nirvana said, have you seen the AB police interview versus Hannah's interview? He was com a complete mess. Hannah kicked back a, uh, back drinking soup. AB admitted he cocked the gun. I agree. I did notice this difference as well, but he's also the one that watched it happen and 
may or may not have pulled the trigger, but was holding the weapon. So I do think it was more traumatic than him for him than Hannah, who wasn't even in the room, although it should have been probably more traumatic than um, it seemed to be for her. Rebecca, does this help or hurt Baldwin's trial given the witnesses so far? Love your channel. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. I kind of think I've seen some things that have helped Baldwin and I've seen some things that will hurt Baldwin. I definitely think there's going to be different and additional witnesses for Alec Baldwin's case. And I think the experts are going to be experts on different things, like how the gun works. We're going to hear a lot more about what he had to do to make it go off, um, that it wasn't broken, that he would have had to pull the trigger or done something to manipulate the firearm to make the projectile exit. I think we're going to hear a lot more about that and a lot less about what the armor's duties are by the state, but maybe the defense will bring up what the armor's duty are, again, trying to point the finger more at Hannah Gutierrez than Alec Baldwin. It's a mixed bag of emotions, and and, and ultimately right. it was Sir, not my fault. My question was, 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 did you remember stating that? Oh, yeah. Okay, that, that's what I asked. Now, uh, do you also recall in a July 11th interview stating, well, I wasn't going to work with her again in the future. So you wanted her fired. Pretty sure like nobody was going to work with her again in the future. But I, again, Luis, like you said, I don't know why he can't just say, yes, I wanted her fired. I just, again, it, it, it was... There were some mixed emotions and uh, in the situation. If I wanted, her, if I really wanted her fired, I could have gotten her fired. Let me ask you that. If you, you just said it wasn't your place to fire her like three seconds ago when we first started this clip. Um, you could have gotten her fired. You could have talked to um, somebody on set. Who was your contact on set? It would have been, uh, well, Gabrielle Pickle was uh, actually Angel Nijem was my first contact with a, with production at Rust, and then it was Gabrielle Pickle. Um, and we heard from her, but, but that's the basic gist. And, and I want to show you some of his dancing cross is still going on in the afternoon. It's going to start with this cross examination. Azam asked Peter could witnesses to this trial testify again during Alex. Yes, absolutely. I expect them to a lot of them is the rattling ammo. The only way to determine a live round. No, 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 no. He is saying he thinks it's the only safe way. So if it doesn't rattle, you shouldn't use it, but we have heard explanations about stuff being removed. So if it has a hole in it, it's a dummy. Um, it rattles, it's a dummy, or if you take it apart, there are certain things that are dummies that don't rattle and you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at them. So there are different ways to be able to tell if something's a dummy versus live. He was just saying, Seth Kenny, that he wouldn't use it unless it rattled because that's the only way you can really know it's a dummy. All right. Uh, Feral Dragon said, Peter, can I talk to you specifically about guidance on a case? You can email me, lawyer you know at gmail.com. If you have a lawyer, it's an active case. Sometimes I can't comment on it. Um, if it's a case you're looking for a lawyer on, we can do some kind of consultation with me or another lawyer at my office. Uh, and it's always a free consultation, but I can't specifically talk to people about certain cases in certain circumstances. People do email and they get frustrated sometimes, but that's a reality. And I specialize in wrongful death, personal injury cases, car accidents, um, slip and fall cases, uh, nursing home abuse, uh, all sorts of cases where people, it ends tragically for somebody at no fault of their own. Um, that is what we specialize in. Um, so John just sent me the poll and it's basically split 43%. They, people think Hannah brought the live ammo on set. 43% think that it was not proven at least yet. And 12% think PDQ, which I think is interesting. I'm not sure what evidence they've had that PDQ in fact brought the live ammo on set, but it is always interesting to hear from you guys. And I love to hear, um, your perspectives, how you take things, how you break things down, how things strike you, especially when, you know, certain impeachments go certain ways. Cause I know the way lawyers look at it, but I'm always interesting. And I learn so much more from hearing from you guys. That's why it's so great to know you guys and be able to talk to you guys about these cases. Um, so I appreciate that always. Um, and we'll continue to do that. So make sure you guys hit that like button before you bounce and make sure you subscribe to our page so that we can continue this conversation on this case and many, many others. Uh, James Crumbly, Jennifer Crumbly's husband's trial is going to start later this week. They're starting to pick a jury tomorrow. So there's more things in the pipe. Also, one of the YSL attorneys was arrested recently. You guys sent me that clip. We're going to be breaking it down tonight. So make sure you hit that reminder bell so you never miss a video on our channel. But for now, that's all I've got. Till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok 
And don't forget to check out the Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, the lawyer you know.